This is the second hour of Physics 1C for November 17th. Now we're going to be talking about what's called the Carnot Cycle. So the Carnot Cycle is um, somewhat theoretical. And the goal is to avoid irreversible processes. Okay? As much as possible. And again, what's an irreversible process? Pretty much any time heat flows from a hot object to a cold object, that's, a, that's an irreversible process. So, um, if the temperature changes and heat flows, that is irreversible. So, I'll write that down. Temperature change with heat flow, this is irreversible. Um, anytime temperature changes, um, well, okay. As long as the temperature doesn't change, then that's a reversible process, right? So if you have an isothermal process, that is to say temperature doesn't change, then this can be reversible. All right? If you have an adiabatic process, this also can be reversible. Because in an adiabatic process, you can, you can have the temperature change without heat flow, right? So any temperature change, irreversible, as long as there's heat flow involved. So if you have a temperature change in an adiabatic process, but there's no heat flow out of the system, we can call that reversible. If you have an isothermal process and the temperature doesn't change at all, this one can be reversible, okay? So every single step that we choose has to be either this or this in our, in our, uh, in our Carnot cycle, okay? Um, In the adiabatic processes, Q is equal to zero, delta T is not equal to zero. In the isothermal processes, Q is not equal to zero, and delta T is equal to zero, okay? The problem comes when you get both. If you have temperature change and heat flow, then it's irreversible. But as long as one of the two, right, is zero, then you could talk about a reversible process. Over here on the right, we have a picture of what this process might look like. Let's briefly go through it and then talk about each step in more detail. Step one, isothermal expansion. Heat comes into a gas. It gets hot. The piston moves up. It does work on its environment. In step two, you have adiabatic expansion, where the gas continues to expand, but it's insulated from its environment. In the next step, you have isothermal compression, so we put it into contact with something that's cold, which causes it to compress a little bit at a constant temperature. We'll talk about how we do that in a second. And finally, adiabatic compression, where you remove it from the cold source and you allow it to just cool down. When I was going through this with the class last time, I noticed that there is a lot missing from this picture, such as where is this heat coming from? Where's that heat going to? Where's the insulation? Okay, so I'm going to add all that stuff in here as we go through this step by step. So let's talk about step one. Step one is an isothermal expansion. Um, at a temperature TH, absorbing heat QH. Now, in this process, we are absorbing heat, but it's occurring at a constant temperature, which means this can be reversible, all right? Now, the question is, where does the heat come from? And for that, you need to have a hot reservoir that you put this system around, okay? And that is gonna make it so the temperature at this point is going to be what we call T hot. God, I hate that, T, H. 
and we're basically just putting it into contact with a hot reservoir, right? This is a hot reservoir. That could be a pot of boiling water, right? It could be um, a very hot piece of a hot metal plate. A hot plate could do this as well, right? You take a gas that has a movable piston, you put it onto a hot plate, the gas is gonna expand. And presumably if the gas already was at the same temperature, it could still expand because you're in contact with this. So it basically can just constantly absorb energy from it, right? Okay, so that's, that's what I think is missing here is that we're placing it in contact with a hot reservoir. Next, what we do is, after it's been allowed to expand here, we insulate it. Here, well, let's use a different color for insulation. Let's use like purple. So now we place it in an insulated container of some kind. So now it cannot lose heat. And it continues to expand for one reason or another, perhaps due to some kind of inertia. All right, so step two is now what is an adiabatic expansion. Um, this is going to be from TH to TC. So it's adiabatically expanding, no heat's being lost to the environment, so as a result, the system has to cool down, right? We actually talked about this a second ago. So in this process, the temperature change is from TH to TC, okay? And you can actually see that, oh my God, it did it again. This thing, TH to TC. Now, if we look on our picture, let's look at what's happened. So step one was from A to B. Our picture is a PV diagram, right? Pressure on this axis, volume on this axis. We've seen this before. And drawn here are four different isotherms. So each one of these represents a different temperature. In case you don't remember why that works, it's because if I plot pressure versus volume for an ideal gas, it looks something like this. You get P is a function of V, and the pressure is inversely proportional to volume, which means that this curve is gonna look like Y equal to one over X. And if you remember from your math classes, one over X looks like this. If you put another coefficient here, like two over X, you're gonna get a curve like this. Three over X, you're gonna get a curve like this, right? They're simply going to just be kind of at different locations. Um, so that's what's happening here. We have the same number of moles for each of these isotherms, and we're gonna be traveling kind of between them. In step A to B, the temperature is constant, so we're gonna stay on the same isotherm. So going from A to B is where we absorb our QH. Right there, you can see it on the picture. B to C, which is number two, right? B to C, adiabatic expansion, we're now cooling, and we're going from this isotherm down to this isotherm right here. All right, next step, number three, we're now going to remove our object from its insulation and now allow it to dump heat into a cold reservoir. So now we again have to put this into like maybe an ice bath or something like that. Let's say that we have like an ice bath over here. Um, so this is going to be our cold reservoir. And this thing is going to be able to absorb heat without changing temperature. So this is going to occur at a temperature that we're gonna call T cold. All right, and now we're on this isotherm down here where you can see that it's labeled as TC, T cold, right? And we'll travel back up in this direction because it's isothermal compression. So the pressure is increasing, but the volume is going down, right? Volume goes down in this direction, it goes up to the right. And if we go from C to D, we're at a higher pressure, right? The pressure here is gonna be a little bit higher than the pressure here, all right? So we extract energy from it, and this is gonna be an isothermal compression. Isothermal compression at TC uh, dumping, or uh, what's the word for it? Rejecting, that's the word they use. Okay, I'm with that. Rejecting heat QC. Finally, we return back to our uh, insulator. Maybe we throw this thing in a cooler or something like that. <laughs> See, in order for this to be a real engine, you've got to actually imagine how you would construct this thing. And that's, that's why I'm including all this stuff on here. But this is, it's really just a thought experiment in a way. It's, just, it's a way of thinking about what a perfect engine might look like. So now we put it back into an insulated container so that it cannot add or remove heat. Uh, it continues to compress adiabatically now. This is now adiabatic um, 
compression, right? Yeah, compression. And here we're going to be going from TC to TH. So here I'm just going to write here that we go from TC up to TH. All this stuff is going to be useful when we do calculations here in a second. So it's adiabatic compression um, from TC to TH. All right. And now we're back in the original state again. We're back to point A at the original pressure, volume, and temperature that we started at. And we can repeat the cycle over and over again. And the work done will, of course, be the area under the curve. And as long as there's a little bit of area here, no matter how slim it is, you're still going to get work out of the system, right? And you're, of course, getting work uh, over here. And then you're cooling the system down again. And you're doing work by putting it in a contact with a hot reservoir, right? So the, the energy comes here, the system does work, and the energy goes back out there so you can get it back to the original setup so you can then continue this. Presumably, every single bit of this process is reversible because we haven't broken any of these rules up here, right? And what we'd now like to figure out for the Carnot engine is what is its efficiency? Okay, because what I told you is that the reason why the second law of thermodynamics produces this upper limit on efficiency is because all of the processes that we describe are always irreversible, right? We now have a system that is, sub theoretically at least, a reversible system, right? And what we're going to find is that even still, you can't get 100% efficiency, <laughs> okay? That's, what, that's the whole point of this, is just basically show you mathematically and conceptually that even such a device that has only reversible steps will still not be 100% efficient. And it's going to provide a good model for it, like kind of a good baseline for perfect machines in a way, if that makes any sense. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go through this. First thing we wanna do is to figure out what QH and QC are, because we know, right, that the efficiency of an engine uh, was something like this, right? It was one minus Q, C over QH, right? For a heat engine? Is that the equation? I think that's the equation. Yeah. Okay, so if we can figure out what this ratio is, we can find the efficiency. That's just, that's the whole thing, right? So let's do it. Okay, first step first, let's talk about QH. QH occurred in step one, right? In step one, we're talking about isothermal expansion. So if it's an isothermal expansion, we can say that QH then has to be equal to W, right? Let's just, let's not skip steps. There's no point. So start from the third, first law of thermodynamics, delta U is equal to Q minus W. This is an isothermal process. For an isothermal process for an ideal gas, delta U is equal to zero. That means that Q hot is gonna be equal to the work along the line A to B up here. So we get QH is equal to the work from A to B, but this is a expansion process wherein we can do the integral, well, I'm just thinking about it. It's probably faster if I just write it down. Integral of pressure dV is gonna be the work done. And of course, to do that, we do the integral of the ideal gas law, nRT over V, dV. We're going from what I'm gonna call the volume at point A to the volume at point B, right? So we'll go from volume A to volume B. This is a process where we're going from A to B after all. And this will then be equal to um, in R T natural log of uh, VB over VA. And what was the temperature here? This is why I wrote it on here. That's what we call T hot, right? So that's what we put here, we put T hot. And that is going to be our QH. Okay, nothing new here. We're just applying ideas that we've seen before. Um, let's use a different color for the next step. All right. Step two. Oh, well, let's go straight to step three, actually. Step three, we can say the exact same thing for step three. Delta U equal to zero should be equal to Q. Step three involves Q cold coming out, right? So QC minus the work done from C to D uh, should be equal to zero, zero. Actually, I don't need to write it right there. We'll just put it right here, zero. That means that QC is equal to the work from C to D which means same thing here, right, is equal to the integral. We put the limits on the integral now. Uh, we're step three, we're going from C to D, 
from C to D. You can see the volumes are different, right? This would be VD. This would be VC, right? Volumes on the, the so-called x-axis here. So we're going to be doing this integral from VC to VD. For NRT, temperature is now the cold temperature over V, dV. This is going to be NRTC, natural log of, whoops, we're going from C to D. There we go, VC to VD. Natural log of VD over VC. But let's think for a second. Oh, and this is equal then to QC. Which is bigger, VD or VC? VD. Right, so VD is... What do you all think? Which is bigger, VD or VC? VC. What other people think? C, Kate says, anybody else? Look at the picture. Volume D, volume C, which one's bigger? C, right? Okay. So we know that VC is greater than VD, which means that this would be negative, right? So what we can do is we can pull a negative sign out, N, R, T, C, natural log, and I just flip it now. All I did was just say, pull the negative sign out, and now we have log of VC over VD inside of here because it just flips it, right? Okay, so there we go. That's our QC. We didn't necessarily have to do this right now, but your book just loves doing this. They love playing this game with minus signs. I think all physics textbooks do. This would have shown up in the later equation anyway, even if we didn't do this, but we're kind of prepping it. They love doing it. They're like, they're like oh, we know, where this, we know where this is going, so we're going we're gonna to get that negative sign out right now. I don't know why they do that. Anyway, this is just to show that QC is in fact a negative number, as it should be, right? Q8 should be positive, it's going into the system. QC should be negative, it's coming out of the system. All right, let's look at the other two steps. Uh, for step number two, two is an adiabatic expansion. And for adiabatic expansion, that's where we start to use the connection between temperature and volume. Now, the thing is that I told you that our goal, right, is to find the efficiency, right? And you might say, oh, hey, well, we have QC and QH right here. We can find the efficiency. But we really can't do that because I haven't told you what volume D, volume C, volume A, and volume B are. I could, of course, pick some numbers or something like that. But what we can do is we can find a relationship between those volumes by using what we know from uh, for adiabatic processes that we've learned. And what we've learned is that TV to the gamma minus 1 is a constant. So... In step two, let's go back and see what step two was. We're going from B to C, right? So I can say that volume B and volume C are related to each other via this expression. But what we need to put in here are the temperatures. So I want you all to look at this picture up here and tell me volume B, right? Should I put T hot or T cold right here for volume B? Volume B is here. Kate, I believe you're correct, because if you look at this isotherm here, you go down to here, you can see that that is, in fact, the, the hot temperature. And um, you can also see here that we went from B to C, which is T hot to T cold, however you want to think about it. That's actually the main reason why I drew these on here. It's much like your textbook. I'm thinking ahead to what these equations are going to look like. So we said B and hot go together, and C and cold go together. That's just a coincidence. So we get that expression, and we'll do the same thing for number four. And we can use the same color because it's basically the same thing. So we're going to write TV gamma minus one equals TV gamma minus one. Process four at the top here, we went from D to A. So we go D here, we go A here, and we went for, oh no, there's no way you can see that. That's definitely behind my picture. Sorry, we'll go up. That's our equation right there. Let's move it over a little bit. That way I can go back up here and you should be able to still see it. I can't get it on the same page. So up here, D corresponds to cold and A corresponds to hot. You can check that on the picture too. So for D, we'll put T cold and for A, we'll put T hot. 
and we're just going to check on the picture to make sure it makes sense. D is on TC, A is on TH, so we're good. So now we have these two expressions, and what we can do is we can use them to figure out what things like the ratio of VD over C is versus the ratio of um, VB over VA, right? Because if we rewrite this like this, I can make, I can do this, I can make a division here, and I can put, I want, um, I want VB over VA actually, and I want VC over VD, right? So basically I wanna take this equation here, oops, and I wanna divide it by this equation here, like this. Because then what I'm gonna get is, cancel, oh no, I see the problem. We gotta we got do a little more rearranging. We need this one on this side. We need that one on that side, but that's fine. That doesn't, that's fine. You can, you can flip the equations. Okay, now we've got VB over VA over here, VC over D, VD over here. Just to check, this is VB over VA, this is VC over VD. It's good, and now things start to cancel. So we've got boom, 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 boom. Cancel the exponents because they're everywhere. I'm sure that's not very mathematically correct. I mean, I know it's, I know it works though. So this ends up being VB over VA. You could, I could have, okay, let, let's just not skip this. Let's, let's not do what I did. Probably a lot of people are looking at that and are like, oh, you can't do that. Sure I can. Just raise both powers to the one over gamma minus one. Uh, but we can do it a little more clearly. So this is equal to VB over VA raised to the gamma minus one power equals VC over VD oops, raised to the gamma minus one power. And now, since they're both raised to the same power, that means that the thing at the bottom of the power, the base, must be the same. Right? If this was squared and this was squared, you could square it both sides. Of course, we can do the same thing by raising both sides to the one over gamma minus one power. So we get that relationship. That's nice, because now what we can do is we can take this equation. We want QC over QH, right? We'll take this equation, QC, and we will divide it with QH. Make it a little bigger so they're kind of like about the same size. We'll just divide these equations here. And we will get that QC over QH has to be equal to NR. NR are going to cancel. So we have negative TC divided by TH. And that's it. Because here you have the log of VC over VD, the log of VB over VA, but we know VC over VD is equal to VB over VA. So certainly the log of each is the, they're also equal to each other, right? Like if this was, if this ratio was two and that ratio was two, the log of two divided by the log of two is also one, right? So you're just left with negative TC over TH. Or since we're talking about efficiency, as I said earlier, being equal to one, what was it one minus QC over QH, right? But these are absolute values. Well, from this equation here, we know that uh, the absolute value of QC is a positive number. The absolute value of QH is a positive number, and these should be equal to uh, TC over TH, which temperatures measured in Kelvin are always positive, right? So the ratio is just equal to TC over TH, and that means that the efficiency of the Carnot engine, we'll call it E Carnot, is one minus TC over TH. It's just the temperature difference. It's just the temperature difference that shows up. Now, when we look at the efficiency for any heat engine over here on the left, while it makes some sense, I mean, you can also write it, I always find it's a little easier to understand it if you write it like this. Work done divided by heat input, right? But, um, I don't need absolute value on that actually. But when you write it like this, you, you kind of lose some of the idea of what was happening here, except to understand that in order for it to be really efficient, you want QH to be really large and you want QC to be really small, right? And we've discovered that it's impossible to have this statement be 100% efficient because we've said that there's always going to be some exhaust heat coming out of your system, right? But now look at this equation right here. Look at this equation right here. 
what this equation says is to, to have a really efficient Carnot engine, you need this ratio right here to be as close to zero as possible, right? As close to zero as possible. And how are you going to do that? How are you going to make this zero? Can any of you think of a way to make it zero? What are two ways that I can make this ratio zero? First of all, I should just ask, is it obvious to you all that as long as this term is zero, that the efficiency will be equal to one? That's obvious, right? Okay. Yeah, everybody can see that, right? Okay. So one possibility, Andrew says, have temperature hot be infinity. That's true. If we make T hot be very, 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 very large, then our efficiency should be pretty large, as long as TC is kind of cold, right? As long as TC is kind of cold. The other option would be to make TC zero, right? It's not TC, Ryan, it would be TH you would want to go to infinity, right? And TC you would want to make really small, right? So the other possibility would be if we could have a cold reservoir, remember, what was TC, right? It was the temperature of our ice bath, right? Our cold reservoir over here, right? And T hot was the hot reservoir here. And really the work that's happening in the system here, sorry, the check on that stuff. Um, what's really happening in the system right here is that if this is extremely hot relative to this, your engine is going to be more and more efficient. And that's where the thing you asked about rockets, the book mentions that the way that a rocket works is it makes it this as hot as possible because it can't really control the temperature of its surroundings. Now, the cool thing about an engine is that it's actually going to operate better in space than it would on the planet, right? Because in space, the temperature of space is something like about three degrees Kelvin, really cold, right? And the temperature of the rocket engine may be like a thousand Kelvin or something like that, right? And so if you do one minus three over a thousand, you have a really efficient engine then. Now, the rocket engine are not actually Carnot engines, though. That's this is, again, this is the efficiency of kind of an ideal engine, right? And in reality, you're not going to be able to get this much efficiency. This, in fact, kind of places an upper limit on how efficient any engine can be, right? And I think that one of the statements of the Carnot, sorry, one of the statements of the, uh, um, yeah, one of the, the, the next statement of the, uh, the second law is that no heat engine can be more efficient than a Carnot engine operating between the same two temperatures. So this is the upper limit. It's like an upper limit on efficiency. And this is what I was trying to say that we were going to do with all of this. Let me finish writing what I was writing. No heat engine can be more efficient than a Carnot engine operating between the same temperatures. So given that that's the case, right, that no heat engine can be more efficient than this, because we intentionally made it so this one has no, no irreversible processes, all reversible, right? Even then, there is an upper limit. And because TC can't equal zero, there is no, it takes an infinite amount of energy to, to cool a system down to absolute zero. The temperature of space is above absolute zero. We have no access to anything that actually has a temperature of absolute zero. If we did, if somehow in the future, and I'm sure this will probably happen 10,000 plus years from now, but it, in, in the, the near future, we have no hope of actually reaching absolute zero. In fact, we think it's impossible. We believe it's impossible. You could reverse this, you could turn this on its head and say that the second law of thermodynamics basically states that it's impossible to reach absolute zero, right? Because if you can't get an efficiency up to 100% and we figure out that the only way you can have a 100% efficient engine is if you have a temperature of zero, but you can't get to absolute zero, then it's kind of this circular logic. You know, I don't know if it's circular, but you could say that it's impossible to have 100% heat efficient heat engine because we can't get to absolute zero, therefore, we can't get to absolute zero, and as a result, it's impossible to construct efficient engines that are 100% efficient. Sorry, I got kind of excited and I started talking a lot. Did all that make sense to you all? Does anyone have any questions or comments?
Let me get some water while you're typing. Why the same temps? Well, so I give you a I give you a Carnot engine, and I tell you that you can calculate the efficiency, and you say, "Well, I need to know the temperatures, right?" Um, I need to know the temperatures, and you tell me, "Okay, my hot temperature is a thousand Kelvin, and my cold temperature is three Kelvin." All right, and then you say, "Okay, now I can calculate the efficiency. It's one minus three over a thousand, so it's going to be ninety nine point seven percent efficient, right?" And now I say, go try to make a heat engine using a hot reservoir that's 1,000 Kelvin, a cold reservoir that's 3 Kelvin, and try to make it more efficient than that. And what this is saying is that it will, that it will never be more efficient. Because any engine you de de design, any, understand, any real engine, a Carnot engine isn't a real engine, right? It's a theoretical engine that has the most efficiency you could possibly get for those temperature differences. Um, so now go try to construct a heat engine and make it 99.7% efficient and use those same two temperatures. And you're going to find that it's impossible. Does that, does that answer your question, Jacob? That's why you have to, you have to put this in here because, you know, let's, let's say that I have a Carnot engine that has two temperatures that are really close to each other. It's not going to be very efficient, right? So if this is like, let's say, um, what's, what are two numbers that are easy to use? Let's say that this is 50 Kelvin and let's say this is a hundred Kelvin. Okay easy math to do, right? Because it's one minus 50 over 100, which will be a half. So that engine would be 50% efficient, right? Um, so given 50 Kelvin and 100 Kelvin, the claim is that there's no way you can make an engine that's more efficient than 50%. But what you can take out of this is suppose you want to design an engine and you want it to be the most efficient possible, you want T hot as hot as possible and you want T cold as cold as possible. Does that make sense? This is kind of a theoretical construct that allows you to think about how you could improve engine efficiency, right? Um, it's not always that simple. Real engines have real parts that rub against each other, and there's, there's all sorts of things that go into it that are that are going to make it uh, complicated. Okay, we, we have to keep going. I want to hopefully talk about entry before the end of the night. All right, so we're going to do a couple problems. Um, first one is analyzing a Cardo engine one. It says a Cardo engine takes in 2000 joules of heat from a reservoir at 500 K. So that's going to be T hot is 500 K and it takes in 2000 joules of heat. That's going to be QH. It does some work, discard some heat to reservoir at 350 K. That's going to be QC. The question is, how much work does it do? How much heat is discarded? And what is its efficiency? Let's start with the efficiency one. That one's really easy to do. No, it's not. Oh, we have the temperature here, 350. Oh, whoops. Whoops. That's not QC. That's the temperature cold. Okay. So let's do efficiency first. Efficiency is equal to 1 minus T cold over T hot. So 350 divided by 500. If I multiply by 2 over 2, I'm going to get 70 here. So I'm assuming this is going to be 0 0.3, which would be 30%. Um, how much work does it do? Uh, probably easier to find how much heat is discarded first, because we know that uh, QC over QH absolute is equal to TC over TH. Keep in mind, these have to be in Kelvin temperatures. So if this is the case, then that means that we can find that QC absolute should be equal to QH absolute value multiplied by TC over TH. So QC absolute then is going to be equal to QH, which is 2000, multiplied by TC over TH, which is 350 over 350 divided by 500. And that is 70% of this, so 1400, I think. Is that what it is? You all tell me and calculate it. I'll do the next part. Um, what is it? We did that. How much work does it do? Okay, so now if I know QC and I know QH, and we go back to our equations up here, I believe we had an equation that said that QC was equal to W plus QH. 
or W minus QH or something like that. Where was it? Probably scrolled right by it. Oh, it's a heat engine. No, I was thinking of the refrigerator we talked about earlier. If it's a heat engine, that means that the work is equal to QH minus QC, right? So that's going to be 2,000 joules minus 1,400 joules, which is 600 joules. Okay, do you all agree with all those things? 30% 600. Absolute value of QC is this, but QC is actually negative. I mean, if you want to write it that way, QC is actually negative 1400 joules, but whatever. I like the absolute value part. Okay, next one is... Dude, this problem took me, I think, 40 minutes. On Monday. How did I cover all this stuff on Monday? <laughs> I have no idea. I think we spent a lot more time in the refrigerator, honestly, and I don't, I don't think they gained much of an understanding of it. Yeah, okay. Maybe we won't get to entropy tonight. All these entropy problems are really easy. I, I think this, pro this problem is very, this is very worth doing. This problem is a really good problem. It's 100% worth doing. It just takes a really long time. Ah, we're gonna try to do it. Um, I'm gonna leave this for you to study yourself. I, I'm just gonna tell you that entropy is really easy. And that's not that easy, actually. That there's two ways to find it. Um, yeah, we're just gonna talk about it next week. Whatever. Um, but uh, for doing your homework, I would highly suggest that you just read the textbook. It's entropy is not hard to do calculations with. The idea of what entropy is is kind of complicated. All right, let's try to solve this problem. I could just go longer, and then you can leave if you want, and I can put it up as a video. I may do that. All right, so Carnot Engine 2. Suppose we have 0.2 mole of an ideal diatomic gas with gamma equal to 1.4. It undergoes a Carnot cycle between 227 degrees Celsius and 27 degrees Celsius, starting at, an at, starting at pressure A equal to 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals at point A on the PV diagram. I, I recopied the picture here so we could have it. Um, the volume doubles during the isothermal expansion step A to B. And we got to solve for all of this. Part A, find the pressure and volume at points A, B, C, and D. Part B, find Q, W, and delta U for every step. There's four of them. So that's three times four is 12. That's a lot of numbers to calculate, although a lot of them are zero. Uh, C, find the efficiency directly from the results of part B and compare with the value calculated from equation 24 at 14. This is the E equal to one minus TC over TH equation. Okay. All right, let's tally up all of our variables here. I think I'll write those over here, all of our knowns. So what we have is 0.2 moles of an ideal gas. So N is equal to 0 0.2 mole. Um, it undergoes a Carnot cycle between 227. That's going to be T hot, obviously. So T hot is going to be equal to 227 plus 273, which I believe is 500 Kelvin. Check that for yourself. TC is 27 degrees Celsius. 273 plus 27 is 300 Kelvin. Um, we're also given pressure at point A is equal to 10 times 10 to the 5 pascals. And we also know the volume doubles during the isothermal expansion step A to B. That means, I believe, that if we take VA and we put VB over here, if going from VA to VB is a doubling, that if I take 2 times VA, I believe that should be equal to VB. Would you all agree with that? Yeah. All right, so that appears to be all the information we have, unless I missed something. And the other information we have is that A to B is isothermal, B to C is adiabatic, and then isothermal, adiabatic, and we can obviously use that to do some things. So part A says, find the pressure and volume at points A, B, C, and D. So let's start at point A. Um, in order to find the volume, at, the volume at point A, we know what the pressure is. Oh, let's do some other things here. This was TH. No. Yeah, isothermal, right? Yeah, this is TH. This is TC. This is TH to TC. And this one is TC to TH, right? Let's put those on there as well. Those are helpful for when we're doing this. 
Okay, at point A then, we have a temperature TH, a pressure A, and number of moles. So we can use the ideal gas law, right? We can say that volume at point A should be equal to PV equals NRT. So NRT uh, hot divided by pressure A, right? So 0 0.2 mole, 8.31 joule per mole Kelvin. Um, T hot is 500K. And we divide that by pressure, which is 10 times 10 to the five Pascal. I'm gonna quickly put this on my calculator. You all are gonna have to kind of, we're gonna have to go through this relatively quickly to get anything done reasonable here. Cause there's just like, there's like 35 answers to this problem. I don't even think I'm exaggerating. I really think there's like 35 total answers. Uh, 0 0.2 times 8.31 times 500. So just check as I'm going um, because I could easily make a mistake. I have the answers in front of me though, so I probably won't make a huge mistake. So I get um, a volume, VA, that is equal to 8.31 times 10 to the negative four. And then we know that VB is just double that, so that's easy. So take that number and multiply by two, I get a number that's gonna be 1662, I think. So this is gonna be 1.662. So there's VB. The next thing we can do, we already know the temperatures at every point. And if we know the volume at point B, can we find the pressure at point B? Sure, right? P, P V B uh, sigma minus one, is that, can, can we use that equation? It's not sigma, it's gamma, and no, because it's only for adiabatic expansion. Um, I'm pretty sure we can use the ideal gas law again to find pressure B, right? Because pressure B should be equal to NR. Oh, but it's a... Uh... No, this is adiabatic. All right, I lied to you. You can't use that. You can do what you just said. Isn't this what we would do? No, we can find the pressure. Uh, we can use for, or if we're looking for pressure at B, can we use just the uh, ideal gas law? Oh, well, we don't. We don't know what the temperature is. No, we do, but the temperatures are changing. It's not a constant temperature, so we can't do that. Yeah, you're right. But we can. We can do that. Yeah. Uh, hold up, hold up. I'm looking at the wrong thing. I'm looking at this picture here. We should be looking at this picture here because that's where volume B shows up. That's where pressure B shows up first. So you can't use the ideal gas law. We're good. So we can do NR TH again and then just divide by VB. And if you compare it to this one here, it's the exact same equation but divided by double the amount. So I'm pretty sure the pressure is just going to end up being half of what it was before. So plugging in the numbers, I'm not going to keep writing down numbers. 0.2 times 8.31 times 500, right? Divided by VB, which is the answer we just got, so we can use that, equals, yeah, it's exactly half. Okay, so this is 500,000 pascals. Okay, staying on track, let's go to step two now, because now we got to find some information about point C such as the volume at C and the uh, pressure at C, right? And for this one, I think this is where we want to start using our gamma minus one equation because it's adiabatic expansion. So to find volume C, we're going to have to do TV to the gamma minus one equal to TV to the gamma minus one because now pressure is an unknown. We can no longer use the ideal gas law because pressure and volume are unknown now for point C, right? pressure and volume. It's a whole new pressure and volume down here. So we need to use this. And we're going from B to C, so we can go put B here. 
Remember that B corresponds to T hot, so T hot shows up here, and C corresponds to T cold, so C shows up right there. We wrote this exact same equation down just a moment ago. And we're solving for the unknown. We know what VB is, we're trying to find VC, so rearranging, we're gonna get VC is equal to VB multiplied by TH over TC. I am very tempted to skip a step, but I won't do it. So the gamma minus one is here, the gamma minus one is here. The way that you remove the gamma minus one, I think we did this, I'm just thinking of Monday. If we raise both sides to the one over gamma minus one power, that'll eliminate the powers on these, and we'll end up getting that VC is equal to VB multiplied by TH over TC raised to the gamma minus one. Plugging in the numbers that we have, VB was 1.662 times 10 to the minus three in the cubed multiplied by TH over TC, the ratio is 500, it's 5 thirds, uh, 500 over 300, and then we raise that to the gamma minus one power. No, wrong, to the one over gamma minus one power, my bad. Sorry, that was a mistake right there. It should be one over gamma minus one, because we're eliminating these powers here. Um, so that's going to be one divided by 0 0.4, because gamma is equal to 1.4, one minus gamma is, yeah, so this is gonna be one over 0.4. And that's equal to if any of you can answer these faster than I can calculate it like feel free I got 5.96 times what is this volume 10 to the negative 3 Okay, now that we have VC, we can find PC using the ideal gas law. Now again, the reason why we had to use this equation was because pressure C and volume C were unknown, but once we find one of them, we can find the other and use the ideal gas law. So pressure C should be equal to NR TC is T cold, it just turns out to be the case. Uh, divide that by volume C and we get 0.2 times 8.31 times TC is 300, we divide by the number we just got, boom, boom, and we get an answer of 83, I'm pretty sure this is the right answer, 83656 Pascals, that's PC. Okay, we're almost done, we found A, B, C, we just need to do D, and for D here, it's isothermal, so we can probably use the ideal gas law if we know PC, BC, we should be able to use the ideal gas law now, right? So, now PD and VC, sorry, PD and VD are unknown, right? Both of them are unknown. But it's isothermal, so can't can can we just do this? Can we just do that? Oh, it doesn't matter. That's not gonna help us at all. Because <laughs> they're both unknown. I think we might have to go to step four, unless I'm crazy. Am I crazy? Nah, we have to. That's what they do too. Okay. Yeah, anytime you have two unknowns, there's nothing you can really do. There's not another equation. So we have to look at uh, the, the adiabatic step again, where we go from VD to VA, and we just put our T's in here. Volume D corresponds to TC, and volume A corresponds to TH. Put an equal sign here, raise each one to the gamma minus one gamma minus one, and then solve for our unknown. Our unknown is VD, so VD is going to be equal to VA multiplied by the ratio of TH over TC. Did I make any mistakes here? I just wanna check. Is A the hot one? A is hot, right? Yep, A is hot and D is cold. D is cold, yeah, okay. Raise this whole thing to the one over gamma minus one power again. Uh, it's basically the exact same equation from before. So we're gonna take uh, VA, which was 
that first thing we calculated up here, 8.31 times 10 to the negative 4. That is that one. And then we're going to multiply by 5 divide 3 raised to the 1 divide 0.4. Two point nine eight times ten to the minus three meters cubed. That's in VD. Let's do that because we're kind of running out of room. And then finally, find pressure D. So pressure D is going to be equal to N R. Uh, D was the cold one, right? Yep. N R T cold. I just want to check. We did do hot for the other ones, right? Yeah, we did. Okay, cool. N R T cold divided by volume C. That's going to be equal to T cold's three hundred. V C is five point nine six times ten to the minus three equals eight three. Wait a minute. I don't think that's right. Oh, can anyone see what's wrong with this equation here? I think Jacob already saw it. This should be D, right? Yep, yep. All right, I'll try it again. 0. 0.2 times 8 point, oops, 31 times TC. TC was 300. We divide by volume D, which is the volume we just got, of course. I'm an idiot. 167312, and that is the right answer. I know that's off the screen, but I'm going to scroll down anyway. You'll be able to see it. Okay. Okay. Now, we need to find... That was one part of the problem. It took about 20 minutes to do one part. It's crazy. Uh, part B. Find QW and delta U for each step for the entire cycle. QW and delta U for each step. For the entire cycle. So let's start with part one. We know in part one that Q equal to zero, but the work is greater than zero. We also know that the work done is equal to the negative of the change in potential energy. Now, um, it's isothermal, right? So do we want to do an integral for this part? I think we can, right? We can say that the, the work is equal to the integral of nRT, what is it, T hot, divided by the volume. You go from, oh, I'm sorry, you're right. What am I doing? Sorry, thanks, Kate, I appreciate that. Um, let's just not skip steps. Let's just not skip steps. That usually helps. Okay, so QH, WAB, we know, what is it? It's isothermal, which means this is zero, which means the work from A to B is equal to Q hot. And um, to get the work from A to B, that's where we're going to do the integral of n r t hot divided by volume, and we're doing from VA to VB, which, as we've seen before, this integral becomes n r t hot times the natural log of VB over VA. And we plug in the numbers. What do we get? VB over VA is 2. It's easy to do. 0. 0.2 times 8.31 times... T hot is 500, and VB was double VA, I remember that, so it's times the natural log of 2. And we get 576, so this is going to be equal to QH, which is going to be equal to WAB, and it's equal to 576 joules. Let's make all of these new calculations a different color. All right, so that's, that's part of it right there. Step 2. Step two is adiabatic expansion, which means Q is equal to zero. I was getting ahead of myself. If Q is equal to zero, that means delta U is equal to W uh, from B to C. But 
We also know that delta U for an ideal gas is equal to N C V times delta T, right? We're going from T cold, T hot to T cold, right? So this is gonna be T C minus T H, right? And what's C V equal to? I believe C V is equal to R divided by gamma minus one. Is that right? Yes, yes it is. So this equation becomes delta U is equal to N R T C minus T H divided by gamma minus one. So this is gonna be equal to 0.2 times 8.31 times uh, five, no, 300 minus 500, divide by 0.4. What did I, yeah, that looks right. That's not the right answer. What did I do wrong? Oh, if I divide by 1,000, it'll be the right answer. Divide by 100, oops. Right, 100, so it's gonna be 831. That is correct, okay, uh, but it's negative. 831 joules because it's it's cooling down and this is also equal to the work from B to C okay so we've gotten four of our 16 answers oh and of course we know here delta u is zero and here q is zero all right step three we repeat what we did in the first step I'm going to skip all the steps up to the last step here and we're just going to say that the work done from C to D should be equal to n r it's now t cold natural log of final minus initial. So it's gonna be VD over VC. Do these have a two to one ratio too? They do. Um, so this is gonna be equal to 0 0.2 times 8.31 times TC, which is 300 times the natural log of VD over VC. So VD was the one that was 2.98. Those have to be double, right? So it's the natural log of 0.5, I think, equals negative 346 joules that's also going to be equal to qc right yeah and it's it's supposed to be negative so that's good all right so that's the work from c to d and that's qc it's also correct finally step four um now we're going to say that delta u in step four is equal to the work from d to a that's the final step and again, this is gonna this is gonna allow us to say that delta U is just equal to N times molar specific heat constant volume, which we've seen before is actually equal to R divided by gamma minus one multiplied by now it's gonna be T hot minus T cold because we're going from cold to hot, and this then will be equal to eight thirty one exactly, and it should be exactly the opposite of this one because if you look at the way the calculation is done the only difference between this calculation and this calculation down here is i've just changed these around so 831 joules is equal to the work from d2a also equal to delta u from that part and we're supposed to find something else we, we got all our parts um find q w and delta u for each step and for the entire cycle okay so what's the what is delta u for the whole cycle well Delta U here and here for the two and four is the only place we have delta U because delta U is zero for part one and it's zero for part three because it's isothermal. So our total delta U is zero, right? As it should be. So total delta U is just gonna be 831 joules minus 831 joules. So it's 831 joules plus negative 831 joules which is zero, but this we already knew because it's a cyclic process, right? Anytime you have a cyclic process, you come back to the exact same state and then you repeat it over and over again, the change in internal energy has to be zero, okay? To find the total work done, then we just have to add up all of the works. So that's 576 plus negative 831 plus positive 831 minus three set 346 and so you can see that a few of those cancel right i'll write them all out five seven six joules thanks kate minus uh three four six joules plus eight three one minus eight three one is equal to 230 it looks right to me i agree two three zero joules so this would be the total work you get out of the system every cycle you get this much work
We're still not done. Any questions? That was a lot of steps that I did there. But we also did those steps symbolically when we talked about the Carno engine. So I, ho I hope you understood what we were doing. And if you didn't, you can always go back and watch it again, or you can read the book, because it's all in the book, too. All right, finally, find the efficiency directly from the results of part B, and compare with the value calculated from equation 20.14. Okay, to find the efficiency directly from the results of part B, lots of ways we could do this. We could probably take 230 and divide by QH. We'll see if that works. I'm curious. Yeah, it totally works. Okay, we'll do it that way. So we found W and we found um, QH earlier, right? We know one of the definitions of efficiency is work over QH. So if we plug in um, the work done by our system, which is 230 joules, and we divide by QH, which is step one, right? 576 joules. I get an efficiency of 0 0.399. And if we use the other equation, which is that the efficiency is 1 minus TC over TH, then we're going to get 1 minus 300 over 500, but 300 over 500 is 0. 0.6, and 1 minus 0. 0.6 is exactly 0. 0.4. So you can see that they, they, they do give the same answer here. Sorry for going over tonight. I got a little bit excited about some things, and that's just what happens. Um, I, I guess the easiest thing to do is uh, I'll probably just include the... Uh, the other half of, uh, the, like, the very last half of my class on Monday. We talked about entropy for, like, all of, like, 20 minutes or something. But I'll include that with your all's uh, videos. And you can you can read that. Or you can watch those videos, or you can also just read about entropy in the book if you prefer. You don't have to waste the time watching the video if you prefer to read about it. But if you watch the video, it it isn't very long, the part where we talked about entropy. Okay? So... There you go. Hope you all have a nice night. I will see you next Monday. We're doing a lab on Monday. Just want to re-emphasize in case those of you don't know, everyone should come on Monday. And we might be able to do an extra lab. Although an extra lab would mean an extra write-up. That may be good for some people. We could have like a, kind of like an extra lab and then I can drop a lab. And you can kind of be optional. What do you all think of that? I'm going to stop the recording. We'll talk about this. But everyone come next week. Okay? Everyone come. You understand that? No more two groups. We've only got like 10 people left in this class. Maybe 12. <laughs> so, so everybody come next week. Okay? We don't need to split up into two groups. And some of these labs, we need extra people. So uh, anyway, enjoy talking to you all tonight. Hope you have a good night. And I will see you uh, in uh, on Monday night.